the next question I want to put to the group, and again, it's just for those that you might have an answer. We've talked about you know good advice, good ideas, and things that have come out there. Mark touched on it a wee bit. Um, what about the war stories, the problems you've come across and you've had to solve? Is there anything you, you want other groups to have the heads up about something that can become a big issue and, and how to deal with it or how to resolve it or how to prevent it happening? Roger's waving. Roger? Are you just muted, Roger? Yeah, I was just, yeah. I just talked to myself whilst I'm unmuting myself, Aaron, <laughs> that's all. Um, the biggest challenge we had was setting up a bank account uh, for our incorporate society because of the um, uh, anti-money money laundering law, no one wanted our money. Um, so that was a challenge. Um, but no, apart from that, no, none really. Um, we've been, uh, well, I've been gobsmacked and, and, our group, and, our, and our committee on our RRCC, Rangatiki Rivers Catchment Collective, um, the support we've had from farmers doing what we're doing is just amazing. Um, when, they, when they find out from the grassroots that it's been driven by farmers um, and the competition, the, the, the competition is, we've got one member in our group, Mark Crystal, uh, who's a fantastic leader of a subcatchment group. Um, he uh, talks about tributaries or, or tribs all the time. And we're doing quite a bit of water testing. We're doing more water testing in our Rangitiki Rivers Catchment Collective um, than what Horizons are. And that's not a criticism of Horizons. It just tells you how enthused our farmers are in our catchment um, to actually understand what's happening. Uh, and when you sort of put the water results up, between different tributaries within a subcatchment, the competition between those farmers is immense. And it's really inspiring to see how engaged farmers are when they actually start to learn and understand how they're affecting the, um, their, their environment. Um, you know, about three months ago, four months ago it probably was, we all wrote submissions, 15,000 of them for the, um, the government freshwater policy. None of us, and I'd say no one on this call, um, and not many farmers in this country had any information to provide to the government to fight what we were, what they were imposing on us. What the subcatchments allows us to do, and we're on the journey, it's a long journey, this is a long journey, it's not just a five minute wonder, is to gather this information and then we can push back and say, well actually our waterways are better, we are doing this and we are doing that. Before it we had nothing. So. And our members in our subcatchment groups and our, our corporate society, all the, all the umbrellas, we've got nine of them now, subcatchments. Um, they're growing like a mushroom. We've got another five or four or five underway that are in, that are in the process. You can't go fast. You must go slowly um, uh, when you set up subcatchments. You've got to get everyone on board, which I've already said. But getting everyone on board, getting that story, getting that information, and being able to share it later on and push back is immensely powerful. That's me. Thanks, Roger. And Peter, you were definitely waving at the screen. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, we haven't had, and we've had lots of little problems, but nothing's impossible if you go into things in a positive, uh, with a positive frame of mind. And look, there's tons of people out there that are willing to help you. We've had wonderful farmer support of anything that we do. Um, our funding has just been a matter of. Um, driving to Dunedin, talking to the regional council, developing relationships, um, giving them evidence of what we're doing and talking with them. And then they're willing to, you know, they were willing to help with funding. And the district council is exactly the same. And the, uh, the money from the irrigation company, that was, um, that was sort of seeding money to get us started. They've since reduced that, which is, which is perfectly fine. And, um, so that side of it's worked. It's just a matter of getting in the car, getting off your butt and going and doing it. And just that a, we always have the debate of, do we have a farmer subscription? We've got about about 200 farmers on our database across um, across the North Otago region. And um, we always have that debate. And um, we say our skin in the game is our voluntary hours that we put into this organisation. And... Um, <laughs> We, we, as I said, we continue to debate that, and um, I, you know, lots of there's been lots of different views here that, that you do need some skin in the game. But we also pay a water rate, we um, um, we pay district council rates, and because we are a non sort of political group and a um, genuine community group, where we we've done projects, we connect with the schools, we um, help out on the Alps to Ocean Cycleway, then. 
and that's all voluntary hours going in. So that's the that's what we see as the farmer's skin in the game. And largely, we're promoting, well, we believe we're promoting um, good management practice, and we don't want to duplicate, we don't want to have duplication. So we look to the beef and lamb, the far dairy and Z for information and help coordinate programs within our region for specific catchments. And we so we're coordinating that rather than reinventing that information or um, and just bringing those people in to uh, help farmers with their questions. Um, Peter, I'm actually going to just ask you another question because um, you sort of mentioned it there and also because you're the one farmer I think on here from a, a different industry, mainly arable, where the others are mainly sheep beef. How did you find it or, um, and how did you manage that? You've got, I know your catchment too, I happen to live in it. So you've got arable farmers, you've got some horticultural farmers, you've got sheep and beef, you've got dairy. Uh, different interests, different maybe competing interests. How did you find getting them all to work together and, and have you been able to bring them all together okay? Uh, well, we operate our region a bit like Roger with sub catchments, and so sub catchments tend to be of similar farming type. So um, they might be largely dairy farmers in that sub catchment or largely um, our high country farmers in the mountains that you can see behind me. Um, so yeah, I guess it is the, probably one of our biggest problems is because we had seeding money from an irrigation company and that's how we, how we started. The focus was around irrigating irrigators rather than um, dry land. And so it was hard to pull dry land farmers in because we didn't have, initially we didn't have a value proposition to sell to the, um, to the dry land farmers, but now with the, the environment the way it is, it's it's becoming more and more important for farmers to um, join up and um, take an interest and and there's, we're all part of the catchment. We all all have an influence on what happens in, in the catchment, whether we're a dryland farmer or an irrigated farmer. It's just irrigated farmers tend to be more intense with their production and therefore probably do have a more of an impact. Uh, but so yeah, it's just taken a little bit longer to get the dryland farmers fully engaged, and we're and look, we're still working on it. Yeah. Cool. And but again, no conflicts. Good. Again, Josh, I can't see if you're frantically waving at the screen. I don't know whether you've got anything to add on this sort of question around uh, problems and fish hooks and so on. Yeah, look, my comment, and I'm not sure what Ben was going to say here, but um, from my experience working with Hernua District Linky Group, I, I suppose I have a caution or a Maybe just a note about being in the if a catchment group is going to be set up uh, around focusing on the policy space, be aware of what that means. Um, that was principally that one of the reasons that HDLG exists, and, and we have moved away from it. But what we discovered, I mean, this is it took us seven years to get a plan change um, in the Hurunui. Um and when I joined our committee was reasonably enthusiastic, and that was four years after the initial uh, group formed. Um, but by two years in, our committee, I think, would happily, well, not happily, they, they would admit that everyone was reasonably jaded. Um, it takes quite an emotional toll to be in that policy space, which, is, which to me was quite surprising. Um, the other thing about the policy space is that it can be quite divisive, um, and we have that issue um, if we're honest in our catchment, um, a divide between irrigated dairy farms and dryland farms. And so part of the thing we looked at when we we're saying, oh, where do we go from here is we said, well, we have to continue representing our farms because unfortunately, if we don't, um, we don't feel that they'll be ad adequately uh, represented. But at the same time, we do need to look and try and um, uh, address this divide that has formed in our community. And so that's something that we've been quite intentional about with our projects going forward, is that how do we start to bridge that divide that we, that has formed over the last seven years? Um, and we have that as a part of our One Billion Trees uh, planting program application. It is working on hill country, but also we have projects looking at um, riparian planting um, enhancement with, members, uh, with people that aren't actually members of our group, even. Um, so I suppose that we, we will continue in the policy space, but I just would add a caution that know what you're getting into. Yeah. 